Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, based off of an excellent write-in suggestion from one of our amazing listeners, today we are covering the history of the locomotive. Don't remember the listener that wrote in, but you know who you are. That's, that's right. I just don't want to make it too public and make them embarrassed. You know? Oh, I gotcha. I gotcha. Yeah. Surprisingly, yeah. again, I don't know how we skip these sometimes. Like, I, like we were talking right before we went on air on and air, yes. you had said, oh, we did like the rail system, but we never did the individual locomotive itself. I think we may have even did the steam engine possibly or something like that, or maybe famous engineer kind of thing, but we never actually did the locomotive itself. Yeah, I'll admit they've really gotten away from me, what we've covered and what we haven't, who we've talked about and who we haven't, you know. It's apparently maybe, maybe 314 you is every too now much. and then. Maybe a satellite gets recorded twice. <laughs> Jerk face. The second one's doing better than the first one. <laughs> fun fact for you, Luke. Right off the get go with a fun right fact. Off the it's gotta be a good one. Uh, do you first off, do you like sheets, get go, or subway better? Uh oh, I'm definitely a sheets. Yeah, yeah. me too. MTO okay. can't beat it. Yeah. All right. Fun fact. The first recorded theoretical steam engine dates back as far as 200 BC. And there's a drawing of it showing this ball containing water mounted over a cauldron. So of course that would heat it up and it would cause steam to come out and it would have like exit holes or almost like straws even sticking out mm -hmm. of it. And that would cause it to spin the cauldron and therefore you'd be able to, in theory, harness that spinning power to do something else. Yeah. And so why do I mention that, Luke? Of course, because the steam engine is such a critical part of the history of the locomotive. Yeah. So the steam engine existed like way before the locomotive. Like, it did, it turns out. Yeah. Like really, really far. So the cat who is... I think the original steam engine, not steam locomotive, but Thomas the train. Thomas the train. Do you think that's where it came from? Oh, oh my goodness, my I, mind. I know. I so, wonder. Okay, so let's Thomas. <laughs> uh, would you say Newcomb men? I would. I would say Thomas, Newcomb. Thomas Newcomb. So this cat lived back. Uh, he was born 1663. He died 1729. He was a blacksmith from Dartmouth, England. Oh. Um, and he was the first to assemble a prototype of a modern steam engine. It was also known as an atmospheric steam engine, probably That's because cool. it didn't because it didn't pressurize. Like it's probably similar to what you said. It was just steam being released. It wasn't pressurized probably. at the time. So this was back in like 1712. He came up with this. Yeah. 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 For sure. <laughs> I like what I saw. It was like. Although it wasn't very efficient, hundreds of these engines were made and they were pretty much used for like pumping water from coal mines mm -hmm. or, you know, different areas that had water issues. He was known as an ironmonger, which is a trained blacksmith. Fun fact. I want to be a monger of some sort. <laughs> I, huh. I'll, I'll keep my thoughts to myself. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. Um, yeah, so his atmospheric steam engine, uh, it produced uh, six to eight strokes per minute. That's not uh, very many. Which is pretty terrible. It's like the slowest. Uh, he improved it to 10 to 12 strokes there per minute. Go. But my guess is it was probably moving, like, like to your point, it was used for like things that you would rely on people or like horses or donkeys. It was probably in a coal mine or something right. like that. So, uh, so probably hey, was like a quality of life kind of thing. You, you poo poo this, but like, if we said, Hey, company X, Y, Z, we can improve your efficiency 50%. We're like, yeah, mm -hmm. now sure. Going from eight to 12 isn't sounding that impressive but hey that's good improvement yeah uh so the next sequence if you want to get to the next Ooh, person hold on let, or me, do you have let something? me stop real quick yeah so i talked about the mines and how they used this great invention to pump out the water but another impact that the mines had on locomotives and the rail transportation system uh was because of mining as well and so like the first recorded use of rail transport in great britain is with sir francis willoughby's walletin wagonway Oof. Ooh. 
wow. and Nottinghamshire. God, I love their names. Is this and the this second is time we talked about Nottingham today? <laughs> this is Nottinghamshire. I don't oh, know the difference. That's but... where Frodo lives that's with Frodo. Robin Hood. <laughs> Shire, yeah. So anyways, and in like the late 1600s-ish, um, these railed roads uh, were used in this area and they were used to move coal. Now the primitive ro- railways here weren't like they had a locomotive running on them, right? They had like carts that you would place on them, mm-hmm. fill them with coal, and then get them up using the the rail systems there. But this was how, and I won't go into it because it's not that important, uh, they started to learn more about building the actual rails that locomotives would then run on in the future. Because before they were like either too brittle or the design wasn't really good because uh, they would break or they became uneven. So a lot of the the testing and a lot of the trial and error happened on these early tracks that was just u- that were just used for pushing coal around mm-hmm. which then led to the ability to have locomotives running on them without fear of them failing. Mhm. All right, moving on. So the next person in line, we're still not at the locomotive yet, James. No, no, still not there. Uh so another famous James, not you James, but, an, but a l- little less famous James. So James Watt, mm-hmm, 1736, mm-hmm. he died in 1895. He was a Scottish inventor. If it's not Scottish, it's crap. Uh, he was a mechanical <laughs> engineer. Uh, do you know what that's from? Well, no, what is that from? <laughs> so I remember it. It was a but... Saturday Night Live skit okay, where they, yeah. he was playing Sean Connery. Right. Uh, so he was, a, he was a mechanical engineer and a chemist. Um, and he, while he didn't invent the steam engine, uh, he took Thomas Newcomb's, uh, which was invented in 1712, and did vast improvements on it uh, that was one of the driving forces in the Industrial Revolution using steam power. I've seen him referred to as the father of the steam engine. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you haven't, check out our episode on the countries who like made the most great inventors. Scotland ha- was like disproportionately high on that list for what yes. a tiny country it is. And of course, James Watt was one of the, the leaders in the clubhouse there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so he essentially, I'll say, mastered the steam engine. He, he started to pressurize the steam. Um, Obviously there were all kinds of, you know, enhancements in the design and the device. So lots and lots of enhancements uh, over time um, from, from James Watt. Um, And let me see, there was something else that he did. Um, Where was it? I lost it, James. I'm sorry. I wouldn't be too worried about it. So I think we have to get to, just timing wise, we got to make sure we get to someone that actually put this on a locomotive. Oh, hey, go for it. The, so it's kind of torn. Like if you if you if you Google who invented the steam locomotive or steam engine, some some say it was uh, Richard. I'm going to say Trubisky because I can't <laughs> pronounce it, and he's the great grandfather of the Steeler quarterback Mitch Trubisky. But it's not. It's Richard Trev. Trevithick? Trevithick? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Richard Trevithick is credited with taking the first high-pressure steam engine, combining it onto a, you know, a vehicle, a, a locomotive. Um, so he did this. He was involved in the mining industry, um, and it was called the Cornish Giant. Um, and I'm sorry, yeah, the Cornish Giant was that? I, I have some bad notes here, James. Thanks. Thanks for I'm that. I'm sorry. Can you um, grab, do you have him? Which one are we looking at? Is this Richard? Yeah, Richard. I don't see anything about Cornish anything, but I yeah. might have just uh, clipped that okay. one out of there. Yeah. I saw he patented the high pressure engine That's that what powered it is. the locomotive. He wrote back in February 21st of 1804 after a trial of his high pressure tram engine that he carried 10 tons of iron, five wagons and 70 men above nine miles in four hours and five minutes, not minutes, minutes. Yeah. Here's what it was. I don't know where I was going with that giant thing. Uh, He named his locomotive catch me who can was the name of his uh, original locomotive. Um, and he erected a circular railway uh, in Easton Square, and uh, he was able to, that's where he did his demonstrations uh, for that. And yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah, I thought so. Um, so after him. This is I, where it I gets think, real. This is, this is where it gets real. I saw the first commercially successful steam locomotive was the twin cylinder Salamanca. 
Salamanca is a uh, Indian wow. reservation town in New York okay. that has a casino in it. Um, <laughs> that's all I know about Salamanca. All righty. Uh, designed by Matthew Murray in 1812 using John Blenkinsop's patented design for rack propulsion. Um, so whatever that means. Anyways, however, he was not the inventor who designed the steam locomotive that was used on the first public railway system. And this is like really where it gets real, right? And this was George Stephenson, a uh, famous English engineer who created locomotion. Ah, I like that. In Do 1825. Locomotion. Sorry. With me. <laughs> yeah. Um, 1825. And he did this for the Stockton and Darlington Railway in Northeast England. Only four years later, he joined into Rainhill Trails or Trials, sorry, uh, a competition for building the best and easy to use steam locomotive for transporting passengers. Because everyone was like, "Wow, we can get people where they need to go much more quickly with this." Uh, there were a whole four entrants into the competition, competition, and Stevenson managed to win using the rocket. It's a great name. Uh, yeah, it, it reached. 45 kilometers per hour while transporting 30 passengers. Could you imagine seeing something moving 36 miles per hour no. back then? Like no. that's probably why it was the rocket. You're like, oh my goodness, look at how fast that is. Look how fast it is as Meanwhile, I'm walking like, along beside like it. Usain Bolt could probably run faster than <laughs> it. So I don't know if he can still run fast. Is he still fast? <laughs> He's getting faster. old. He's faster than me and you. Wow, that's that's not really much. So he and his designer of tube pressurized boiler received the first place prize, and soon their locomotive started appearing all over Bonnie, England. Is that what we say? Mm -hmm. uh, fun fact for you, Luke: the first locomotive to operate in America was, or on the railways here, was the Stourbridge Lion, built in 1820, and it was imported from England by Horatio Allen to New York. Fun fact number two. Numero dos. Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb, which is the name of the locomotive, built okay. in 1830, uh, was the first American locomotive to pull a passenger car on a railroad what was the, what was the, what were those two years 1830 and 1828 okay so it didn't take us that long two years for, for to us make to... american made american yeah. made america okay uh, before we move on luke we really are over time oh. we need to take a break for a word from our sponsors i have to assume it's amtrak is amtrak still a thing oh yeah it's i'll talk about amtrak a little bit later Fantastic. It is not Amtrak. Okay. But we do have a couple shout outs. Who do Number we Number one, Randy H. Good old Rand. Fan of the podcast. Must say, as a Canadian, you guys had me laughing. You, you gave it your best try at understanding it. I think this is in reference to our uh, University of Toronto episode. Oh, okay. Okay. But our Our universities and politics are just so confusing that even the people in Parliament don't know what's going on. Anyways, thank you for the laughs. I appreciate the content. So that I is, guess we didn't do a great job. That is so Canadian for him to be so <laughs> polite. You guys did a good job. Good try. Yeah. Keep up the good work. <laughs> that really is such a Canadian it. thing to say. I wrote back and I was like, I've talked to a bunch of my friends in Canada and all of them basically said what Randy did is that it's like, it's such a mess and just so different than anywhere else. And the standards are just so kind of like in ambiguous and bizarre that mm -hmm. don't bother trying to understand it. Uh, the second shout out is from Tony H. So Randy H and Tony H, maybe they're brothers. I don't know. Hey guys, I love the show. I have been a fan for about three months now. Thanks, Tony. I am just finishing up trade school to be an electrician, which we know Luke loves, Heck and yeah. decided I wanted to be an electrical engineer. I start school this week at North Carolina State and wanted to know if you have any advice. Now, keep in mind, Luke, that this was two-ish weeks ago, so he's already started at North Carolina State, so your advice that you give him is going to be delayed Thank you. P.S. When do I get to give civil engineers a hard time? <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> could do it. Started now. school. You yeah, could do it I now, think you could basically. Do it. So I, I will say you're going to have a huge like like step up on your fellow That's electrical engineers. Like you go to school to be an electrician, like and you genuinely have done it. Like you you know how to wire things, you know, electrical flow, like you've been shocked before. And yeah, like, you're going to be so much 
a step above everybody else there because you kind of know the practical, you know, application of electricity, not just the theoretical application. Yeah. So yeah, he's, he's going to kill it. I'm sure that he'll be very successful. You basically said exactly what I said in my email back to him. That is really funny. Um, also, I'm curious if he's like, oh man, this electrical engineering stuff's boring. <laughs> like, cause really like going into mechanical, I'm like, I'm going to make engines and I'm going to do this. No, no, I do equations. The other thing too, I mean, I'm just saying, I got a couple friends, they're electricians, and they make some bank. Yeah. You know, it's they're working with their hands, they're not sitting behind a computer all day, depending on kind of what you want to do. You might want to keep that, I'm an electrician might, in your back pocket. Yeah, they might not just have saying. eight managers telling them what to do. <laughs> Ah, goodness. All right. Where are we at with the uh, steam engine locomotive thing going if on here? We'd love for you to subscribe, like, oh, share, review. You totally forgot to spiel. Make sure that you uh, write in if you have any things that you'd like us to talk about. And as always, you can tell your smart device to play the unprofessional engineering podcast. I just made up for your mistake. Don't worry. Thank you, man. This is why I keep you around. Yeah. So I think what we want to do is we want to talk a little bit about how steam engines work. Okay. Maybe. I think that makes sense. We talked about the cat that just invented it. Yeah, why not? Um, so the way a steam engine works, and I actually didn't know this. I mean, I knew st I knew they converted the steam into, you know, like mechanical motion. I knew that. But how they do that. So first of all, it starts out with a firebox. So the firebox is where they start the, the fire. So if you're looking at a lot locomotive, put a cross section through it right behind where right in front of where the conductors sit, there's a firebox in that firebox. They're throwing in fuel could be coal, coal, wood, oil, natural gas, like whatever it happens to be. If it's a steam locomotive, it sucks in air through the bottom to maintain um, the heat. There's an ash pan that collects all the ash that falls out. This whole thing is wrapped in a giant boiler. So it's surrounded by water the whole time. There's essentially like, if you think like control rods, like a nuclear reactor, check out our nuclear reactor thing. Yeah. There's, these, there's these rods that run through this that essentially give lots of surface area for that heat to heat the water you know, faster, more consistently. So there's it basically it's it's a giant hot tub, super hot water. It gets so hot that the water starts to create steam. And then there's all kinds of safety regulation or regulators so that if it ever gets too high where it blows up, apparently back in the day, these things would blow up. If like, if like he was taking us, if the conductor was taking a smoke break and was like, yeah, I don't need to like let off any of that steam, people would die, but all kinds of safety <laughs> things now. So essentially what they do is they release steam uh, into the throttle, essentially that steam moves a valve in a horizontal motion. So this valve basically, it takes a steam on one side and that pushes a piston, which then pulls the wheels, if you think, and then that valve moves to the other side and the steam fills the chamber, that valve slides over, that then pushes the piston the other way. So essentially you're, you're converting that steam with a valve and a piston into linear motion. That then goes to all of the, the driving gears and essentially all those linkages that you see on the wheels are all driven from that very original piston. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a thing in the back behind this called the tender. This is where I, I didn't know there was water in it because I guess the water, you do need to replace the water eventually. I always thought it was just like wood or coal, but there's water and fuel because you got to keep the water levels high so it doesn't burn up. Uh, and that's essentially how a steam engine converts fire and steam and fuel and water into linear motion. Fantastic, Luke. Huh? I, f I feel like you could get huh? hired in the rail industry. As long as it's a steam locomotive, I got you covered. Are you trying to tell me that that's not necessarily the standard today? It is definitely not the standard today. What? Do we want to do a little bit of like where we're at now or a little bit of from now to then? Like where, where do you want to go next here, James? I don't know what either of those things meant, but I think we could certainly do either of those. Okay. So steam engines, they were good, right? But who wants steam, right? No, nobody like, wants steam. Nobody wants a steam engine. So first of all, steam engines are great for the longest time. There's actually still a number you know, around the world still in, um, you know, are they in use, use or are they in museums? <laughs> I think they're in use, but it's more like tourists get on there. You oh, know. it's like, it's a cutesy thing. Like yeah. we're riding on a steam locomotive. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, so this 
quickly transitioned from steam engines and converted to diesel engines. So uh, there was in a like period. In the late 30s, yeah. 1930s, of course. In the diesel engines are kind of what you think. We don't need to talk about how a, an engine works. I think everybody understands how an engine works. Um, Replace steam engine with With a diesel gas. engine. Yeah. yeah, with gas. <laughs> but what I didn't know, I honestly didn't know this. I did not realize that today's locomotives are really electric. They're like a hybrid, but yeah, but, but electric. Mostly. But it's not it's not a diesel engine with a drive shaft connecting to the the wheels. It's a diesel engine that is running an electric generator. And that generator is then producing the power at the wheels. Apparently, it is way more efficient uh, to do that. Apparently. Yeah, no, no, you, you got it. So. Yeah, so like you said, diesels back in the 30s took them about a decade to really catch on. But by the 50s, diesels began really taking over steam power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, steam power is not super well used at this point anymore. Um, let's see. No, that's boring. Diesel locomotive. Oh, yeah. So this is important. So the diesel locomotive, like why did it take over? It was more efficient and it was more reliable. Way more powerful, um, too. Way more powerful, but also it required way less maintenance than a steam locomotive did so like just kind of like a car right um so where the steam power it took hours to get the locomotive ready to service uh when it came to the diesel it was really just changing some fluids and the brake pads and you were good to go the steam engine the boiler had to be cleaned which required a whole crew to climb inside the locomotive to do it the steam locomotives had to be really extensively cleaned before and after they were used and additionally the running gear like the pistons and whatnot had to be lubricated with every use so i think Oh, and they had to be taken off the lines to be cleaned and maintained so often that uh, it the availability of the diesel engine led to needing less locomotives around, and it improved the availability of the locomotive by 35%, because like one in three steam engines had to be taken off the tracks that often for maintenance. Oh, wow. So really, yeah, just the overall investment in it was significantly different as well. Um, you mentioned the modern locomotive. So like, like you said, you know, it's a hybrid diesel. It's mostly electric. It has that diesel engine running that, like the generators. Um, the locomotives weigh between, this is nuts, 100 and 200 tons. So for those of you who use kilograms, that's 91 to 100 81,000 kilograms. They're big. Yeah. And they're designed to tow passenger train cars at speeds up to 125 miles per hour. So slightly more impressive than the 36 <laughs> miles per hour of the original train that won the contest. Um, Siemens makes one of the most modern engines, uh, locomotives now. It produces 4,200 horsepower. And the generator can turn this into almost 4,700 amps of electrical current. Pretty impressive. That's very impressive. Um, okay, before we continue on, we need to once again take a break for this week's Luke's rant. All righty, so this rant is super timely. So depending on when James decides, decides <laughs> to release this. So no, just the other day, it. I'm listening to good old NPR, one of my favorite you know, national public radio. Are you an NPR fan? Uh, no, I mean... No. I, love, I like NPR. I don't it's, listen to the radio, so. I love the radio and I love NPR. Uh, so I'm listening to NPR. Apparently, just this week, uh, rail workers, and this included people that like work for Amtrak and freight companies as well, they go on strike, right? This creates like a huge disruption in the service that the rail, okay. the railways, so like it, it's, it's killing basically delivery of raw materials. It's killing, you know, people transportation with Amtrak, people like literally there was no one to run the trains and operate the trains. So apparently this is the rant. Could you imagine a job where if you're sick and you take off, you get like in trouble. So apparently these rail workers are in some cases required to work, like be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when they do take off, they actually get in trouble 
because they're not allowed to take off. Like in their contract, you you can't be off sick. You can't. So apparently, they they negotiated for some you raises. You can't be off sick. You cannot be off sick. So like their big thing was like like yeah they got a nice big raise and they've been negotiating this for years. Yeah. Um, but they got a nice big raise. But the big thing they wanted they just wanted to be able to have sick time. Like they they wanted to be able to say hey I'm sick like I have COVID or whatever yeah. pancreatitis. And like nope come to work give everybody. COVID or get on a train and have pancreatitis. It's like they weren't allowed to do that. So that's really what they were negotiating for. And it was all in the news. And uh, they now it might not go through. It was negotiated. Uh, the government helped negotiate it. Uh, the I TSA uh, helped negotiate it. And I guess it goes back to the union and then the union has to approve it. So another three or four weeks, we'll know if they accept it. But um, apparently, it's good for the companies, not necessarily for the people. They're going to get a pay raise, but it doesn't sound like they got a lot of the quality of life stuff. So my rant mm -hmm. is be nice to these people. Like all the stuff on your shelves, like all the stuff that we use every day is transported on trains. Like be nice to these people working in these companies. Like, come on. Well done, Luke. So not even a rant. It's a public service. Yeah, a support again. for our rail workers. There we go. You're, you're like a man of the people. That's what ah, I like about you. I try. You try. So this is a good lead in to what I wanted to talk about next, which is the future of Ooh. trains. Are you okay with that? Yeah, I hope we do the future of trains. Okay. Because I didn't do any. Sorry. <laughs> so over the past several years, Luke, there have been a significant increase in people using trains as a preferred method of transportation. So here I thought, since I don't use trains and Pittsburgh basically doesn't have them, that nobody uses trains anymore. I thought this was just like a novel thing that people do, unless you're in like London, who has all the trains. Mm -hmm. Turns out that's not the case. In 2019 alone, more than 32.5 million individuals used Amtrak, which you talked about, uh, which was an all-time high for the nation's longtime leader in passenger train transportation. Uh, with train travel at its highest rates, visionaries are stepping in, Luke, and they've come up with this five-point high-speed rail plan, which focuses in-depth on the nation investing heavily in high-speed passenger rails to connect the country together. So here I am thinking that the rail system's dying off, and actually we're investing in it more than ever. So the nation has these top five high-speed rail priority projects. These are the special projects of national significance, they call them. First, they have a $60 billion, with a B, dollar investment in California's high-speed rail, $20 bill in Texas high-speed, $50 billion in the NEC upgrade, so the New York City tunnels. Gotcha. $40 billion in the Cascadia high-speed trail, so Pacific Northwest trails Makes or sense. trains. And then last, a measly $2.5 billion investment in the Tampa to Orlando, Florida high-speed rail. Yeah, so Florida. nothing helping out old Pittsburgh <laughs> trying to get a train out here to the east to get me downtown to watch the Stillers. Uh, but there are second-tier projects, and that's where Pittsburgh is also not included. Uh, <laughs> Chicago, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Charlotte. That's a good one. Atlanta, Charlotte, Louisville, Nashville, Denver, Albuquerque. That's interesting. Chicago, St. Louis, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Chicago, Detroit. That seems short. Nashville, Memphis, Kansas City, St. Louis, and Chicago to Indianapolis. So really investing billions of dollars in each one of those projects between like eight and 40 billion in those second tier ones. So we're on the third tier, Pittsburgh. I assume we must be. I didn't get that list, but we're like right there. Connecting the eastern half of the city to downtown must be a priority. It has to be. <laughs> All righty. I have a couple of uh, fun, I'll say interesting facts about trains. Okay. If, if, unless, you were, unless you weren't done. I am so done. Okay. So uh, some of the fastest trains in the world. I think we've done this one before. So some of these sound familiar. Uh, number one is the Shanghai Maglev. So we didn't talk about Maglev a lot. A lot. I imagine that this is probably the future of most train transportation uh, or a portion of it, maybe. Does a Maglev have a locomotive involved? I mean, there's an engine that does I the mean, propulsion of it. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it just gets so far away from 
what we talked about. But it go could. ahead, sorry. So maglev, if you don't know what it is, magnetic levitation. Thanks. So. Uh, if you didn't know what that is, is essentially these trains ride above the rails, no friction. They can go super fast. I'd be afraid if the brakes ever went on it. That's why I'd never get on one. Just me. Mm. Uh, Shanghai maglev does... Uh, 268 miles an hour. This is obviously in China. Uh, the number two is the CR400. This thing goes 217. So big difference between number one and number two, also in China. Uh, I could number have swore in past episodes you said you would have gotten on one because mm, I certainly would have. Well, I'm a little older now. Uh. <laughs> uh, uh, number three, again, a big jump from number one, 205 miles per hour in Germany, the ICE3. Uh, we'll jump over to France, another jump down, 900 uh -huh. or 100, yeah, 198, the TGV. Oh, and TGV. then rounding out the top five is Japan. And why I had these, I don't know how they came out of order. Uh, 200 miles per hour is the JR East E5. So those are the fastest trains in the world. Those are rather speedy, I must say. I feel like you could travel all of Japan in like no time if you're riding that thing. Like, yeah, that's fast. A couple um, other fun facts. Yeah, go for it. So uh, largest rail systems in the world. So the United States is by far the biggest. They are literally double, more than double the second competitor. Uh, the United States has 250 kilometers of railway laid down. 80% of it. Uh, accounts for uh, freight. So if you think of like the things we were get moved around, what we were just talking about in my rant. Uh, and then Amtrak, which is our people moving, uh, only accounts for about 35,000 uh, kilometers. Um, Amtrak has 30 routes, 500 destinations, and they cross 46 states. I feel bad for like the the the, the four states or the three states that we don't cross. I I don't even know well, what I they mean, would be. Obvious Hawaii can't be on that list. Okay, so that's one. What's, what's I'll another? I assume one? Alaska probably. We oh no, they definitely through. go. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Probably Amtrak doesn't. in particular, yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah. I don't know about the others. Probably one of those middle states that okay. wants to be okay. in one of the Dakotas. Gotcha. North that makes Dakota, sense. maybe. Uh, second largest is China at 100 uh, kilometers. Uh, Russia, 850 or 85. So India, what, wait, what were, what were we? Uh, we're 250. We're, we're bigger wow. than everybody, like wow. by far. Russia, uh, 85. Uh, India, 65. And Canada, which I thought would be more, but Canada is only 84,000 kilometers. Canada's probably just like one yeah. big one across, right? With a couple little offshoots. Yeah, yeah. That probably. makes sense. Interesting. I have some fun facts for you, Please. Luke. Would you like them? All right. The last steam locomotive was used in the US in 1961 by the Grand Trunk Railroad. And of course, I call that out because <laughs> I always, because that is where Grand Funk comes from. Oh, it is. Had, I was just yeah. being funny. No, we had that as a fun fact in one of our other episodes. Um, after 1961, the U.S. had fully moved away from steam, except in specialized uh, excursion services. So fancy, you know, having fun on a train thing. Um, ever wonder why trains have steel wheels rather than tires, Luke? No idea. Okay. It's to reduce rolling friction. <gasps> oh, so like yeah, when, that makes sense. Steel on steel. Yeah. So when your car's driving on a freeway, about four to seven percent of its potential energy is lost because of rolling resistance of tires. But when you're on a guided track, you know, you don't have to have those kind of precautions, really. I would also think that like just like maintenance, could you imagine if you had to change the tires oh on, a, on a train? Like, yeah, could, rolling you at have those to lift speeds, that thing up and those brakes on. Yeah. Um, the GE VO 16 engine operates on a four stroke cycle. And it's fully turbocharged via two turbochargers and an intercooler producing 6,000 GHP. What is that all about? They're turbocharged? How cool is That's that? That's pretty cool. Um, let's see. Be this is nice for the environment because rail cars can hold three to four truckloads of freight. Just one train can take more than 300 trucks off the road. So that's why it's such a great thing to be having these rails. On average, railroads are three to four times more fuel efficient than trucks as well on a ton mile basis. Um, oh, wow. Railroads can move one ton of freight more than 480 miles on a single gallon of fuel. My truck gets like two and a half miles, so that's pretty good. 
<laughs> um, new locomotives weigh as much as 108 hippos, because why don't you measure things in hippos? And last but not least, Luke, freight railroads haul about 1.7 billion tons each year. That's impressive. impressive. Is that just yeah. US or is that global? I don't have that answer. <laughs> <laughs> so I rode on an Amtrak from Pittsburgh to DC recently. Okay. And I'm just going to say it is dirty. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> do it. Yeah. There were a lot of people with like no shoes on laying across oh. the, the like oh. the seats and it smelled funny and the bathrooms weren't clean. And uh, I'll and, say Pits- uh, was- people from Pittsburgh, we don't have an appreciation for public transportation. We don't. Our bus system's terrible. Our train system's terrible. Our subway, which goes under like one river, terrible. Like it's all awful. So I think we have a very different point of view on yes, public transportation than other people. We don't appreciate so, it. We do not. We do not. Uh, anything else for you, Luke? That's all I got. Awesome. Hopefully you all learned something about a locomotive, all of the great history that went into it, everything like that, and where it's headed with its strong future. Mm-hmm. If any of you have anything to add to what we talk about, if you want to just say hi, if you want to shout out, anything like that, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, see it.